Um, the uh, brief uh, outline here is we'll, we'll just say a few words about our company. And then uh, CSEM technique, which is really what we'll be talking about, is based on finite difference time domain in electromagnetics. So I'll just very briefly introduce this to you. Uh, and then move on to uh, controlled source electromagnetic immediately and show what, we're we get, what we are getting with accelerated CSEM. And I'll conclude my talk. Um, so a brief message about Accelerator. We were founded uh, in 2004 um, as a GPU computing company. Uh, initially to commercialize finite difference time domain solver. Uh, and we had a, a commercial version that we were selling of FDTD in 2005, which probably was the first uh, GP GPU uh, product. Uh, we got public in 06. Uh, NVIDIA was kind enough to invest some money into us in 07. And then we introduced uh, seismic uh, software in uh, 08 into the company, so we became electromagnetics and seismic. And then in 2009, we started our training and consulting business. And as of uh, end of 2011, we trained uh, over 1,000 people uh, in CUDA. Um, so uh, Accelerator really operates in uh, three uh, areas. Uh, oil and gas, uh, where we do a lot of products. We have RTM, uh, forward modeling, and CSEM that we'll, I will be talking about today. In electromagnetics, uh, we're working in RF and microwave area, but also in optical and biomedical. And the, the short story here is that uh, top, all top 10 uh, cell phone manufacturers are using our software to design their cell phones. And then in uh, professional services, uh, we teach uh, CUDA and OpenCL, C++, AMP, um, but we also do consulting in all of the above, uh, as well as multi-core software in general. And CSEM is a particularly interesting product for us because it bridges uh, electromagnetics and oil and gas, so it's right in between our core expertise, so it's a very interesting product for us. Okay, so early days of uh, finite difference time domain. So finite difference time domain is basically a brute force technique to solve Maxwell equations, and it uh, uses uh, finite difference uh, marching time domain scheme to actually accomplish this. Um, you wouldn't probably believe that, but the first product we did was coded in OpenGL because CUDA wasn't there yet. So anything after that, any CUDA, you know, those guys are laughing and are really happy to code in this. Uh, OpenGL was something else altogether. Um, our FDTD uh, from all those early days became a very, very mature product these days. It's running on uh, clusters of GPUs or uh, multi-GPUs in one machine. And uh, from uh, fairly interesting speeds at the beginning these days on four GPUs we're running at about five giga cells per second uh, and it scales very very well. Uh, in 2008 we were working on uh, a product for Motorola which was a big cluster and we were comparing this and marketing this against IBM BlueGene. I, I put this graph here even though it's kind of old because it's, it shows how well FDTD works uh, uh, in uh, GPU. So what you see on this graph here is on this uh, vertical scale here have throughput in mega cells, so how many million cells is processed per second. On the horizontal scale here, you have number of nodes, and each node is composed of four GPU. At that time, we were using uh, S870s as our GPUs. And so what you see here is uh, a red curve, which is linear scaling. The orange curve, which shows how fast uh, our cluster was going up in speed, and what you have in blue here is IBM Blue Gene. So you can see that, for example, for six, for six I think six nodes, so six times four, 24 GPUs were at that time running at the speed of uh, IBM Blue Gene, which had about 2,000 nodes. So that's kind of interesting, shows how powerful this technique was. And these days, uh, FDTD is very, very advanced uh, and uh, feature uh, rich. Uh, technique. We have all sorts of conformal metals with uh, realistic uh, impedances on them, uh, subgridding, which is stable, and we have low frequency extensions that we'll be talking about. For the people who were listening to previous talk, we have a very robust connection with uh, reservoir simulators that we're using for RF heating of oils, and we have extension to uh, pseudo domains uh, like CSEM. And we're also working not on simple grids like uh, Yi grid, but also uh, Lebedev uh, grids. And I will show an example of this in a second. So 
that's one of the latest things that we uh, were working on. In Lebedev grids, uh, we show here a uh, propagation of electromagnetic pulse in a highly anisotropic material. You can see how uh, in Lebedev grip it's very easy to accomplish uh, anisotropic propagation of, of signals. Okay, so now to the core of the presentation. Uh, CSEM stands for Controlled Source Electromagnetic, and it's a uh, potentially very, very interesting technique that has been around for the last few years that uh, has a uh, intriguing feature of increasing probability of finding oil once seismic exploration is done. So what typically would happen People would uh, use classical seismic uh, deep water uh, imaging, and that gives you some lithology and potential uh, places where oil might be, but not guarantee. So say you have 30%, 40% probability of finding oil in those places. And then if you follow this with uh, electromagnetic uh, survey, then you might increase your chances of hitting oil from 30, 40% to 60, 70%. So that's uh, quite an interesting uh, process. The way it works, uh, you have an uh, antenna that is towed behind a ship and receivers on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, in some cases, the ocean is considered deep. In some other, it's considered shallow. We'll talk about this. And this antenna shoots a pulse, EM pulse, at extremely low frequency. For us to switch from gigahertz to hertz was kind of an interesting exercise. And then you listen in all those receivers for the signals that are coming uh, from the ground. And the idea is that wherever you have a layer of hydrocarbon here, the uh, speed of propagation and loss, the speed is much higher, the loss is much lower. So you actually should see a difference in uh, what you receive in your receivers if indeed you have a hydrocarbon layer. Um, so mathematically, this is a diffusion problem. And the fusion problem is quite difficult to solve. It normally takes enormous amount of iterations to actually solve that. Uh, so uh, some people, um, and chiefly Mitet uh, Mao, came up with an idea that followed uh, work, mathematical work of the hop, to change this diffusion equation into a wave equation or Maxwell equation type of problem, with this strange uh, relation whereby conductivity of material is going to be replaced by, uh, uh, by permittivity. So original lossy problem, which is quasi-static and diffusive, with this transformation is changed into dynamic problem, wave-like problem, uh, hyperbolic problem, hyperbolic problem. Uh, and on top of that, the epsilon in this transformation becomes extremely high. So the speed of light in this material becomes very, very low. Of course, this is not a real material. This is pseudo material. And so the whole technique is, is, is working in, uh, in something which is not a reality. Now, what is really interesting here is that if you actually want to go back to electric field in real space, you go through this Fourier-like transformation that has very interesting twist here. Because you have normal J component like you would normally have in Fourier transform. But you also have this real exponential decay of the signal. So in other words, the longer the simulation goes, the more attenuated your signals are going to be. So essentially, after a very, very short simulation run, it doesn't matter anymore what you are doing. So that's a very interesting twist to this technique. Um, so the other problem that you have here is that I did say that this technique relies on transformation of conductivity into epsilon. But in shallow problems, when you have air, there's no conductivity in air. So that technique would actually fall apart if you had to include uh, air layer here. So there's a special boundary condition that one may use to eliminate use of uh, air altogether. And that relies on the fact that we have quasi-static condition. And that leads to a case-based solution of the problem, so in Fourier transform uh, domain, uh, where we actually have to perform on the boundary back and forth uh, FFTs to actually accomplish our results. And we'll see how that affects the solution in the, uh, later on. OK, so here's an example of, of a problem that we've been uh, looking at. So here we have a uh, layer of water. In uh, some cases, we'll consider this layer to be a shallow layer of water, 200 meters. In other cases, we'll consider a deep water layer. And then we have some overburden with a layer of hydrocarbon. And we'll see how this hydrocarbon uh, is affecting the results here. So in short here, what we see is uh, a observed electric field. Uh, what we see on horizontal scale here is offset from the source in kilometers. 
And this is the uh, strength, essentially strength of received field. So what you would see uh, that if you compare results with and without hydrocarbon layer, you see this uh, significant difference, big enough to actually be able to detect that, and perhaps even more significant difference in phase of the received signal. So that's, that's what people are hunting for, that's what we're looking at, and that's what allows you to determine whether or not you actually have hydrocarbon layer. Now it's actually quite interesting to see what is happening in this fictitious pseudo-domain that we're working on. Because as I said, in this domain, there's no loss, uh, which is quite different from the diffusion problem you're looking at. So the waves are generated here and, and happily traveling. You can see uh, on the hydrocarbon layer, there's something going on here. And you know, it continues to, to rumble through this, through this structure. But when you take into account this transform that I was talking about, so let's have a look. This is about one second, about two and a half seconds, three seconds. If we go to the next slide and actually go back to the real domain, you will see that while from one second to two seconds there was a significant change in what we were observing, at three seconds there's absolutely no change at all. So all in all, what it does is accelerates this technique even more than what we are normally accomplishing with uh, GPUs. So we get our normal, normal sort of with four GPUs, 30 layers, 30 times acceleration, and on top of that, we have about 100 times acceleration that results from this algorithm. So overall, this is quite a powerful technique. Um, so back to uh, uh, an example, I'll show you some results. So the domain is a medium-sized domain, about 20 million cells here. Uh, we use a five-layer uh, observing boundary conditions around this material, except uh, for the top, where we use this uh, air boundary, special boundary condition. And overall, thing is solved with uh, METED technique. And we're looking at results at 0.5, 0.75, and uh, 1.5 uh, hertz. There's a broadband excitation, so we can get all those results at the same time. Um, so if we see what is being done on GPU, what is being done on CPU, the uh, FDTD uh, iterations themselves are running on GPU. Um, the volumetric transformation uh, that we've been talking about are quite a bit uh, are time consuming. They're running on GPU as well. The uh, air water FFTs are running either on GPU or on CPU. We'll see what difference does this make. And then, uh, and then receiver fields, um, there's very few of them are running on CPU because that's just easier and they are not taking any time and can be done in parallel anyway. Um, so we have um, three cases that we're considering. Uh, the first one here is simulating, it simulates deep water problem where top uh, water layer is very, very high, very, so very deep and no signal will actually come up to the surface anymore. Then uh, we have a case where we have shallow water problem and air water boundary is computed on CPU. So we'll call this guy air water on CPU. And then we have one which air water boundary, the one that involves uh, FFTs, is also computed on GPU. So essentially all of the time-consuming things are done on, on GPU. Uh, we uh, use two different systems just to see how that goes. Uh, one system, is rather a bit older system, is using AMD and, and is using uh, Tesla 10 series. And then the other machine was using Xeon and uh, 20 series uh, Teslas. So uh, we have results from both here, um, but um, maybe let's focus on, on the Xeon machine, that's a more powerful machine. So in all cases, we used 8,000 iterations for this to um, actually converge. The same problem, if we didn't use this uh, pseudo domain, this uh, fictitious domain, would take about a million iterations. So that's quite a difference in number of iterations that are required here. Um, now, if we look at uh, a case in which we had CPML, so deep water case, uh, we see that uh, average speed of the computations was about 400 megacells per second in this particular case. When we had uh, a air water bander implemented on CPU, so all, all those FFTs were running there, you can see that the speed dropped considerably. So there's quite an effort actually compared to the speed of iterations FDTD FDTD iterations, the FFTs were actually time consuming. And when we actually 
implement even those on GPU and not only run them fast, but avoid communication between GPU and CPU. We're actually achieving a very high speed uh, of those computations. Um, in this sort of a problem, it's a different problem from what we normally do in uh, electromagnetics, where we are usually limited by the size of the components. So elements of the antennas dictate the resolution of the mesh that we need to do. This is a little bit more like what we do in RTM, where you really have very large domain and you want to use as few points as possible to uh, model and simulate this domain. So the answer to this is we're using higher order stencils, not just second order stencil to accomplish this. And not only do we use higher order stencil, but we also use some of the experience we have from RTM, oops, and uh, actually optimize those stencils to minimum dispersion. So as an example, when you do this and compare uh, a second order FDTD with fourth order FDTD for this particular problem, and in both cases we have uh, low enough dispersion in the mesh that we can actually do that. You can see how dramatically the size of the problem changes, and that, of course, creates a huge boost in performance. So uh, what we see is that even though there is a higher order stencil that requires a little bit more, more work, in the end we gain results or obtain results much faster. So in conclusions, um, accelerated and of course, heterogeneous computing is uh, mainstream. I'm preaching to convert it here, so I don't really need to say that. And um, you know, future is going to be using all sorts of machines and all sorts of processors that can come up. But for now, we, we strongly believe that CPU, GPU is, is, is what is going to be used. Uh, uh, CUDA is a very mature technology and helps us a lot. It's much more fun to code in CUDA than in OpenGL, those problems, uh, um, but still requires a lot of optimization, a lot of work. Um, so thank you very much.